Today's video is sponsored by Nobody. Hello everybody and welcome back. I hope you're ready to get weird with wood because today we're gonna to be building a dragonfly table. <laughs> This customer comes to me as a longtime subscriber to me on TikTok. His name is Moses Roses Aberdeen Percheknik, but he goes by Moses Roses Percheknik because Aberdeen sounds pretentious. And he says that he really likes the Helihex tables and his girlfriend or wife, I wasn't really paying attention, really likes dragonflies. When I did tune back into the conversation, I thought, hey, this may be a great opportunity to use this 3D film stuff that I've seen people make coasters using. If it's good enough for a $10 coaster, you know, it's gotta be great for a $2,000 table. To get a good jump start to this project, I decided to show off my poor decision-making skills. The theory behind gluing these paint sticks on is solid, but the practice, uh, not so much. I've done this a handful of times where the goal is really just to keep the boards the same distance apart when I move it. And it works pretty great, but only after you do the CNC cuts. And you'll see exactly what I mean here in just a few seconds. But first we pat the wood down to make sure that it knows that it's a good boy. Seriously, no idea why I do that. It's an uncontrolled urge at this time. And now those paint sticks have become uncontrolled projectiles that can shoot across my shop and knock my eye out. I'm leaning into it though. I just got myself a puffy shirt, so really going with the pirate vibe now. If you're concerned about my eye, don't worry. The doctor has assured me it'll grow back and I will more than likely have superpowers. As you're watching this, you may notice that I have some kitchen cabinets and kitchen countertops in my garage. These are design choices that happened before I purchased the house. I have no idea why the previous homeowner did this, but they have come in super handy, so I've left them in place. I keep threatening at some point that will become my miter station, and I'll cut into the countertops and put my miter saw there. But for now, they are serving the excellent purpose of collecting clutter. After the majority of my paint sticks got cut away, I went ahead and put some new ones on there, and then we were able to make the mold. The white stuff on the bottom there is natural polyethylene, and the strips that I use are UHMWPE, or ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. They are excellent for making molds because epoxy really doesn't stick to them. After I glue those into place, I just go around with a bead of silicone, and I let that cure for a day. And realistically, that's all I need to do. My whole mold process for this takes about 10 minutes. This is the last part of my mold making process and it's mixing up some Wisebond tabletop epoxy. So this will do a couple of things. This will seal the bottom of the mold up completely. So if I missed anywhere with the silicone, that will fill the holes in. The other thing that it does is it kind of makes this into a big bowl. So it removes my need to keep my wood from floating. I would say it glues the wood down to the polyethylene, but that's not really accurate. It basically just makes it a big bowl so it starts pushing down. If I didn't do this part, I would have to make some calls that stretched across the wood to push it down because the wood would float in the deep pore epoxy. I came up with this method of mold making because I'm lazy and uh, I wanted to do less work and this process is much less work. So I pulled out my big box of pigment and I found this box of pigment in the woods. It's called found pigment. I was only like 10 years old when I found it and I know that's probably a little young to be finding some pigment out in the woods but you know it was very exciting. You know I thumbed through each piece of the pigment making sure that I took it all in. And then I would just leave this pigment out in the woods and I would go find it when I wanted to look at it again. There was a strange phenomenon in the 70s and 80s where young boys would find pigment out in the woods. Apparently I stood in front of the camera during the pour so just like our found pigment Magic. Anytime you pour tabletop epoxy, you gotta pop the bubbles with a torch or a heat gun. Unlike the deep pour epoxy, those bubbles will not release on their own. They need some help. And the torch works in two ways. It makes the epoxy less viscous temporarily, which helps those bubbles come to the surface, and then it pops those bubbles that are already at the surface. Anytime I do this, I set a timer for 15 minutes and I do it about four times. So over the course of an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Tabletop epoxy really starts to gel at about the 25, 30 minute mark. So the first few pops are the most important. The last ones just really kind of help even everything out. So when I started making these diorama type tables, I underestimated how hard it would be to find diorama supplies small enough for these tables. That's it's on more than one occasion, I had been searching for lily pads and the other thing, <laughs> willows. But luckily this time around, I did find them and they were in stock and I was able to get them in just a couple of weeks. Placing them into the epoxy leads to a whole nother set of concerns because I'm always worried that the color dye that they use on 
whatever they use to make this is going to leach into the epoxy and change the color of the clear epoxy. So I'm always having to run experiments on these diorama supplies because some of them are terrible and will turn clear epoxy a straight up green. I have a sealant spray that I use, but even with that, sometimes it will still leach into the epoxy. I was really excited about the lily pads, but they had some wire in it, notably to hold them down in a diorama like they're supposed to be used in but I had to cut that wire off and then I would hot glue them down to the epoxy. Now hot glue doesn't disappear all the way, but it disappears enough to where you really have to look for it if you'd wanna see it through a diorama setup. After I got done putting those lily pads in, it was time to put in the blank willows. Our first clue up is blank willow. Blank <laughs> willow. Let's go over to Miss Brett Summers right now. Now Brett, what do you have for us, blank willow? The only thing on my mind, Gene, was pussy. Uh oh, <laughs> pussy, pussy, all right. Same process here again, just cutting off the excess wire, using a little bit of hot glue, and gluing that down to the epoxy. So by in no means are we going for realism here. So we want it to look cool. And if we were to go with realism, like most water that you look at ends up with a brown tinge to it. It's very rare that the water is so clear that, you know, it looks blue throughout. So it's not realism we're going for, it's coolness that we're going for. And anytime you go for realism, you really have to worry about the uncanny valley. And the uncanny valley just means that something looks real, but it looks weird because it's just slightly off. And the big reason you want to avoid that is because it makes you and anybody who looks at it feel uncomfortable. Man, we used to experience this a whole lot in the 80s because they made these baby dolls that looked kind of real, but there was something off that made them look super creepy. And I guess you can get one of those like super realistic babies and those look okay. Those look fine. But if you go back and it's slightly less realistic than that, it looks really bad. So hyper realism, good. Cartoony, not realism, good. Anything in the middle, you're risking that uncanny valley. You can even see it now with uh, train sets. Like you have super real grass, super real trees. And then you go down on the people and they don't have faces and it normally wouldn't be that bad, but since everything else is so realistic, it ends up looking creepy. So now it's time for our deep pour with the Wise Bond Deep Pour Epoxy. Wise Bond. The clear pour is always about the prep work, so as long as I've done my prep work right, this will turn out pretty well. Depending on the pour here, I'm going to give it about four to seven days to cure using that Wise Bond, and sometimes a little bit shorter because I want it a little bit softer when I start to cut it. Um, but if you want to be sure that it doesn't move around at all after that, you want to go ahead and wait at least a week. Sometimes two is even better. I think Cam from Blacktail Studios says to wait three weeks, and that is because there is a chance that you're going to get some waviness in the epoxy. Um, with the multi-pores that I do, I have much less of a chance of doing that, but I do understand what he's talking about when he's doing a very thick, deep pour, that if you flatten it too early... Uh, you're going to get some waviness in it and end up having to do a lot more sanding. Or worse yet, you may even have to just reflatten everything. All right, you can see here that I put this back on the CNC table and I put it on there all cockeyed. And that's because I did it for the lineup for placing the dragonfly. This is a technique I've been playing with quite a bit uh, where I leave the things on the CNC table so I don't have to re-zero anything. That has been working out quite well. The only thing I would like is if... I had two CNC tables so I could work on something else while this cures. Although I have no idea where I'd put another one. I could probably put it in my basement, but then I could never run it because that's why I end up in my garage in the first place is my wife hated all the tool noise coming out of the basement. Oh, you see that Band-Aid on my hand? The craziest thing happened. Um, the flattening bit that you see there, I had two of them, and now I only have one because one broke and randomly flew off and hit me in the hand. That was probably the scariest thing I've ever been through in my shop because it broke through no fault of my own. So if I chopped a finger off because I wasn't being safe and I was, you know, too close to the saw or something, I could deal with that a whole lot better than I dealt with this because I'd set everything up right, I wasn't overspending or anything, and it just broke and hit me. As I'm sitting here right now doing this voiceover, like, Thankfully, I could say there was very little blood and almost no pain, 
but it was a huge hole in my thumb. I probably should have went and got stitches for it. It was such a deep gash that I had a hard time looking at it. Um, like I didn't want to clean it out. I had my wife clean it out for me. Uh, she's a healthcare professional, by the way. It's been three weeks and I'm still not completely healed. So I read that all trauma causes PTSD and I definitely have it, but it's only manifested in now I look at everything in my shop as if it's going to fly off and just hurt me. I know people don't look at me as one of the more safety conscious creators, but I actually am like the one thing that I do that is kind of dangerous is that I wear flip flops in the shop. Um, for me, that's calculated though. I have really bad foot pain. Uh, I have super high arches and really the only thing that I'm comfortable in is flip-flops. I actually shattered the bones in my right foot and, uh, putting them in a shoe can get really painful really fast. Uh, not only that, my feet are really wide, like kind of like duck's feet. So like they push up against the sides of the shoes. But other than the shoe thing and maybe the occasional too many electrical wires strung across the shop, uh, I'm very safety conscious. I treat my tools as if they are out to hurt me. So that really did scare the crap out of me. And I'm curious if you guys have any stories where you've had some near misses and how it impacted you while you were working in your shop. All right, so here we carved our dragonfly, filled it in with a little bit of black, and I figured, hey... Just put that quarter inch bit in there and flatten with that. I ran the CNC manually to do this um, and definitely was the right call. It saved me a whole lot of work. I wouldn't have to re-zero everything. It would be all set up and ready to rock and I would get all, well, most of the epoxy off with a couple of passes like this. I left the dust boot off so you can get a good view of it. So uh, just realize here, like when I'm going back and forth cleaning, we're, we're spinning down. I did run the sander over it for a second, but I realized that was a complete utter waste of time and that when I went to go flatten it at the end it would be nice and smooth but you know always trying out new things to see if something works better here's an example of something that didn't work very well I decided to cut the middle pieces of the dragonfly out with a v-carve bit and an eighth inch bit would have worked way better um hindsight 2020 I don't know what I was thinking I mean when I was doing the design like in my head I'm like oh yeah that's the right thing to do but it definitely was not. And I'll show you what that resulted in when we get to the end of the project. It took a super long time to do too, because if you can imagine flattening something out with a V-bit, I really don't know what I was thinking. Thankfully, with a little editing, we can speed that 12 minutes down to about 20 seconds. So ever since I started using the CNC, I was using a program called Easel, and it is really set up as an easy way to do CNC. -ing. And I highly recommend it for anybody who is brand new to using a CNC machine because it makes it very simple. I can do some fairly complex things on Easel that most people probably can't who are using Easel. Uh, but the big thing that's hindering me now is I can't control the tool path, which is the order in which I do the cutting. So I really need to get to where I can control that better. But V-Carve is really expensive and I'm cheap so if anyone from easel is listening um just know that if you make it so i can adjust the tool paths i will stay with you and i will promote you to high heaven and if anyone from vcarve is listening uh screw those easel guys uh i need some software all right most of the dragonflies i've seen in my real life have been like a mixture of the purple and green they kind of they're color shifting so i kind of wanted to do the same thing i did have a color shift pigment but for medium pores like this it didn't do all that great it really just comes down to the process that I would have had to do to get the effect that I wanted so if I wanted it to actually be color changing and super cool the best way to do it would have been to pour some black first let that go and then pour a thin layer of the color changing on it but the problem there is is this is wood that I just freshly flattened so it's gonna warp a little bit in certain directions right little tiny bit millimeter here millimeter there nothing big it's wood it's supposed to move right then there's differences in when you sand it where you sand it that wood that you're sanding over and how hard it actually is uh, so it could have very easily ended up looking like crap doing it like this i knew what i was going to get and there was always a chance it could look like crap but probably a lot less of a chance again here i used that little trick to flatten it out using that quarter inch bit it's fun to run the CNC by hand when doing these things because you feel like you have ultimate power over it. I'm sure in the future it'll get old and I'll write the G code. The G code is just the code that's used to run the CNC as opposed to like running it by like I'm hitting 
the arrow buttons when I do this. And as you can see there, I made one cut that was a little deep because I accidentally hit the down button, but um, it was gonna get carved out anyway after the wings, so I wasn't concerned there, but it could have been a huge mess and I can't say that I've never done that before by running it by hand. The last little piece is carving out the eyes and the wings again. And this is just a little pocket recess that's a little less deep than everything else. So we can put wings in and eyes in that look really cool. I was so excited to get to this point because it meant I finally was going to do uh, the thing that I wanted to do and the reason that I took this job in the first place. So basically what it was is taking like a holographic cellophane and melting it down into this really cool shape pattern that looked like wings. So I bought some really expensive cellophane and I had it all ready and I was super excited to get going on it. And when I tried to do it, the cellophane would just melt. And at the same time, this company who makes that cellophane reached out to me and was like, hey, we'd like to send you a sample. And I'm like, great, I'm doing this dragonfly table. Can you send me out enough pieces to do the wings that size? So I had the expensive cellophane that I bought, and then I had the cellophane that the company was gonna send me arrive a day before I was gonna do the work. Well, I didn't open it up until I started to try to do the work. And the samples that they sent me were one inch by one inch. And I was super clear with them on how much I needed before they sent me out the sample. As a matter of fact, I told them, don't bother sending out the sample unless you can send at least this much. And they were like, yeah, cool, no problem. And as you can see here, I wasn't asking for a huge amount. It was really just enough to do the wings. So the cellophane I used melted and didn't work at all, but the cellophane that they sent was actually pretty decent. So I went to go to their website and I'm like, screw it, I gotta order more of this stuff. You know, it's for the customer, I wanna try it. And I cannot even remotely begin to explain to you how expensive this stuff was. It was ridiculous. I would venture to say that in terms of the per ounce price, that it was way more expensive than gold. So I went back to Amazon and bought some cheap cellophane because what I realized when I used the expensive stuff was that it was too thick. The stuff that they sent me, it was such a small quantity that it really wasn't gonna be useful except for maybe the eyes. After testing out two different types of the samples that they sent, there was one that I liked more than the other, so I just cut it out with the uh, scissors there and I used some UV epoxy to hold it in place. Now UV epoxy is something I've been wanting to try out for a very long time and um, I really didn't know what I was missing because I had never used it before, right? So like, it's like if your parents raised you as a vegetarian, you would never know what greatness you were missing out at at KFC. And KFC is the perfect example here because I don't really care for KFC chicken. So I kind of thought that's what it was gonna be like. I thought I was gonna try this and it was gonna be a little bit different, but I'd still wanna use my old epoxy. But this was definitely a where have you been all my life moment. I even put it on some of the clear epoxy here just to see how well it would turn out. And within 30 seconds, it's already fully cured and crystal clear. I left a little fingerprint on the top, but that was pretty much it. So this here is the very cheap film that I got off of Amazon. And the only thing that I had to do to make it look like the expensive stuff was heat it up with a heat gun. So there's a company trying to sell super cheap cellophane at a price more than gold because they heat it up with a heat gun first. Now, I welcome anyone to make their profits uh, as they see fit, but in this particular case, I feel like they're taking advantage of artists. So I will leave some links to what we found on Amazon in the description under this video. So I had like eight colors and I chose really between this gold and the blue. And unfortunately on the camera, you really can't see what it looks like in person. And the only way that I could clearly show it was when the camera went out of focus. So when the camera goes out of focus, you can actually see what I was seeing as I was doing this. You really needed two eyes to be able to appreciate all of the color variation that was going on here. My camera kept wanting to turn it all white. Thankfully though, after one of the epoxy, it actually looked the same way it looked to me through my eyes. This part here was super cool. Um, I was really excited to see everything come into shape. The only issue that I really had was I didn't know which color that I should use. I didn't know if I should use the gold or the blue. So I was holding them up and trying to get the people on a live stream to tell me which one would be better. Uh, I even brought in my wife to see what she thought and she had the genius idea of stacking one on the other. So that's what we went with. So I figured the easiest way to cut it out to the right shape would be to use some of that UV epoxy again, firm it down and then go around the edges and cut it out. 
I was a little concerned that I'd be able to push it down enough because I only had two tenths of an inch to work with. Everything had to be below that and well below it so I could pour epoxy on top of it. I started off using this not so ergonomic box cutter, but uh, quickly realized that if I went to a hand razor that that would work a whole lot better. I do have a marking knife that I tried first and it didn't work very well. For what reason, I'm not sure. Spray down with alcohol after I got the wings in to see how pretty it was, and it was super pretty. And still, you can't see it really with this camera angle. But it's not just the angle, it really is hard to see unless you have two eyes. You can actually see it a little bit better here with a little bit of alcohol that's on there, on there. Uh, but all of that's about to change once we start putting the epoxy on. When it comes to epoxy, I tend to be a frothy mixer. As you can see, the epoxy looks almost white, and that's just because of all the air bubbles that I mix into it. So one little trick that I know is to pour it into a silicone mold and pre-pop the bubbles before you pour it into your deeper mold. The void was well under a quarter inch deep, so it shouldn't have had any problem popping all the bubbles, just pouring it in there. But... I was worried that some of the epoxy would seep under the wings. I did use the UV epoxy beforehand to seal all the edges so none of the epoxy could sink under it, and so that we would trap a little bit of air under there, which would make them a little more shiny. If you look closely, you can tell the difference in the epoxy depending on which one I poured first, which one has more air in it. Um, but as we continue to pop, it just became more clear and more clear. I'm not sure if this technique did anything for me on this pour, but it made me feel better about it. I gave it a full 48 hours to cure because at 24 hours, tabletop epoxy is cured, but it's still a little tiny bit soft. And I knew I was going to run it through the drum sander. And if I'm going to run it through the drum sander, I want it to be a little bit harder because a soft epoxy would really gum up my drum sander and just cause a whole bunch more problems than is worth it. That first pass through the drum sander really is kind of played by ear. You're listening for it just to kind of barely scrape the top because you can't take off that much at a time with the drum sander. It is a slow process, but it's still way faster than hand sanding. Um, this is about 15 minutes boiled down to like less than 30 seconds. But really having Becca there to help me speeds it up, but not really speeds it up. It makes it less boring. At least I can sit there and BS with her while we're doing it. We get front and back, but then we gotta make sure that we clean off the drum because there's a whole lot of epoxy that got stuck in there. And realistically, um, the drum sander belt doesn't last all that long. It does a ton of work, takes a lot off, um, but they really don't last all that long. Um, the last thing I'm gonna do is hit it with this oscillating sander, and that's the major sanding all done at this point. Um, I'm gonna spin it both ways. There seems to be a little bit of variation in how it sands in the, the one direction. It's not a perfect 90. It's just like half a degree angled out, so flipping it over speeds that process up. Again, we use that big rubber eraser to take off any of the epoxy that gets stuck on the belt, and that's a necessity. And the belts don't last super long because you're taking off a ton of material with these things. And when we're done, it's nice and smooth and everything's clean. One thing that I will note is that there is more cleanup to do after this sanding than there is to do when we do the CNC flattening. On camera, what you guys see, when it comes off the CNC, it looks pretty harsh. Um, but really, it's more of a visual thing than an actual thing. Um, when we sand off the CNC marks, I mean, you do a couple passes and they're gone but you do the sanding with a 60 grit through the drum sander, and it's a lot more than a couple of passes. You gotta sit and work on it for a little bit to get all the scratches that the drum sander left in, in, in the wood. I mean, trust me, it's still way easier than starting from nothing, but flattening would make it a whole lot smoother to start with. I did a quick round over here because I knew I was gonna round it all over after I did 150 again, 
but I figured if I did it now, uh, as it was rough sanded, that it would make that second pass so much easier and it did and even here i lowered the round over bit in about halfway did a pass and then lowered it all the way for the second pass then i could leave it set up and after we got to 150 with it it would be ready to go so this is a great shot that shows how much work it actually is just to get out the lines from the drum sander um, you can see them kind of in there. They're pretty deep. So the drum sander got out the little screw up that I made with the CNC. It was only about two hundredths of an inch. So it wasn't all that much that needed to be taken out. I didn't actually go down any deeper than I normally would have. Here I sealed up the edge again with that UV epoxy. And that's really because uh, the wing got exposed. And remember I left air under the wing. So there was a nice little crack that was left. There were a couple of pits on the bottom of the table uh, that I, again, I used that UV resin uh, and tried it. So um, I'm falling in love with this stuff because just because it cures so fast, it's like a thick version of CA glue to me now. I am a little apprehensive on it because I don't know how it's going to hold up in sunlight UV, right? So I did stick it on a piece of epoxy and stuck it in the window I have here in my garage. That window doesn't have any of the UV protection on it that a normal window would. So um, we will see in, in time. As long as that you know yellows at the same rate, I think we're good. But if over a couple of weeks it makes a clear line between the two is where I would have concern. Here I gave it a nice little water pop between the 150 and the 240. We're only gonna go up to 240, so I wanna raise as much grain as I can before that, um, because after that, we're gonna go ahead and finish it with a hard wax oil. So with the Helihex tables, I have a couple different options at this point. I could flood coat it, which would make it crystal clear. I could polish it to where the epoxy would be crystal clear and the wood would still look like wood. Or I could sand it to 240 and put hard wax on it. And that's the one that I chose to do. And the reason I like doing this so much for the hella hex tables is because it really adds a whole nother dimension to the table. So anything near the surface will be nice and clear, but anything deeper in the table will look out of focus. So it kind of adds depth to it. The hexagons themselves, you'll get all the full depth and see those very well. But I do really like how that ends up looking where these things in the table look out of focus. It's really not a whole lot of work for a table this size to go ahead and go all the way up to polishing. It is kind of a pain in the butt to do a flood coat on it because anytime you do a flood coat, um, it's gonna take you at least three days, typically more like five days to complete. The flood coat is really only another hour of work, but the problem is then it has to sit for all of that time to cure. Uh, it takes up some of your shop space. But more important than that, I kind of hate the way that flood coating looks. So I have one flood coated table in my house and it's a plant table. It's got a live plant, my wife waters it, and water gets on the table, and that's the only reason that I have any flood-coated stuff in my house. And from a certain point of view, it really shows all of the wood. It makes the wood look really nice. I think that's great. Um, my problem is, is when I touch a piece of wood, I want it to feel like a piece of wood. It's kind of like veneer, too. I don't, I'm not crazy about veneer. Um, and it's more of what I know with it than the reality of how it is. So. I don't want to touch a piece of wood that feels like plastic and I don't want to have a piece of wood that I know is only an eighth inch thick covering up melamine. So you may notice I am using a different hard wax. I'm using Natura, which actually tested a little bit better than the Rubio Monocoat in my independent testing. I don't believe anybody else is testing because I think they typically have a monetary agenda. Uh, I can tell you for sure I'm not sponsored by Natura. They sent me this one little bottle of it, but I had already bought a big bottle of it, so it didn't help all that much. But when I tested it, it was slightly more resistant to acids than Rubio was. It was slightly more durable than Rubio was. Now, the durability one, you, I could have been on the fence with that one because I did this thing with the screws when I rubbed the screws all over them. It, it was really close, and I just felt like it was a little tiny, tiny bit better. As for look and feel, I could not distinguish between the two myself. Um, neither could my wife, neither could Becca, so it's pretty much exactly the same that way. The Rubio still smells a little bit better, if, if that means anything to you. I don't know it, what it is, but I think Rubio uses some sort of synthetic sandalwood fragrance. 
in the end, it worked just about the same. And you can tell me by what you think of the results here. I think I'm still going to put a nano coat on this one. Uh, and I'm still up in the air what I'm going to do for the legs. Uh, I've been looking at a couple of different options. I'm not happy with my legs right now, but I sure am happy with how this turned out. Get weird with wood. <laughs> If you got a shovel and can dig it, check out these other videos before I got a pop filter for my microphone.